Hello, I'm Hans Stein from the University of Illinois, and I'll talk to you today about methodologies for evaluating quality of feed ingredients. This is part of a presentation that I gave at the Midwest Animal Science Meetings in Des Moines in March 2011. And today I will present the first part of this presentation and talk about feed ingredient composition. The remainder of the presentation will be recorded at a later time. So when we talk about nutrition in general, we talk about three main areas. The first area we talk about is what we feed to the animals. That means the composition of the feed ingredients that go into our diets, the nutrients, the energies, and so forth, and also the anti-nutritional factors and maybe toxins if they are present. Those are all related to the feed ingredients that we use. The second area of nutrition is what happens to these feed ingredients when they are ingested by the animal and get into the GI tract. And here we talk about digestion, absorption, and excretion of nutrients. And the third part of nutrition is what happens in the rest of the body after the nutrients have been absorbed from the GI tract. They are metabolized, new compounds are synthesized, compounds are deposited, and if there are any excesses, they will be excreted. So these are the three main areas of nutrition, and today I will talk only about the first area. So when we look at the nutrient composition of feed ingredients, we can actually learn a lot just from analyzing the concentrations of nutrients in these feed ingredients. The first thing we usually look at is the moisture level or the dry matter concentration. And obviously, we want the dry matter to be as high as possible because animals get nutrients and energy from the dry matter part, not from the moisture part. And usually most of our feed ingredients have a dry matter concentration of 86 to 90 percent because at that dry matter level they can be stored for longer periods of time. If the moisture is greater than 10 to 14 percent, we usually have trouble storing our ingredients. So we try to dry them down to 86 to 90 percent dry matter. The second thing we might want to look at is the concentration of ash in our ingredients. The ash analysis is easy and it's inexpensive and it tells us a lot about the ingredient we have and I'll give an example of that later. But we have to remember that it's in the minerals part that the calcium and the phosphorus and other minerals are present and we know that these minerals are needed by the animals, so we do need to have an estimate of the concentration of calcium and phosphorus and other minerals in the ingredients. However, we do not want high ash concentrations because that will reduce the concentration of other nutrients and also reduce the concentration of energy in the ingredients. When we talk about protein, we talk about amino acids, and in particular the indispensable amino acids that are needed by the animals, and we de therefore have to analyze our ingredients for amino acid composition. Pigs don't need protein, they only need the amino acids. And we can have relatively high protein concentrations without having high amino acid concentrations, and we will talk a little bit about that in a few minutes also. Carbohydrates is not something that we always analyze ingredients for. However, depending on the ingredient we are looking at, it may be important to analyze for starch, and if we do that, we should use an enzymatic procedure to analyze starch because that procedure is the most accurate one. We may also want to analyze for fiber, and here we can use ADF procedures, NDF procedures, or TDF procedures. And all of these procedures will tell us something about the concentration of fiber in the ingredient and to some degree also the nature of the fiber we have in the ingredient. In the old days we used an analysis for crude fiber, however that analysis is now recognized as not being very accurate, so we usually don't use that anymore. The last thing we analyze for is fat, and when we do that we prefer to use a procedure called acid hydrolyzed ether extract and that means that we acid hydrolyze our ingredients prior to extracting the fat with ether. And this procedure will tell us the total concentration of fat in the ingredients. 
Sometimes we may also want to know the composition of that fat, and if that's the case, then we need to analyze for individual fatty acids in the fat. And this is important if we have vegetable feed ingredients with a relatively high concentration of fat because some of these fatty acids may have negative impacts on the product quality of pigs and can result in soft bellies and soft back fat in pigs if they are fed these ingredients. This is an example of why it's important to analyze for ash in feed ingredients. In this case, we have two different products. Both are called whey permeate. You see what we call whey permeate. One contains 8.96% ash, but what we call whey permeate 2 contains only 1.72% ash. And we can see how that influences the concentration of metabolizable energy. We have that measured here in Me in kilocalories per kilogram dry matter. And we can see that permeate 1 contains 3,081 kcals per kilogram dry matter, whereas permeate 2, with the low ash concentration, contains 3,593 kilocalories Me per kilogram dry matter. So this illustrates why it is important to determine the ash concentration in these ingredients because they directly influence the amount of energy that the animal can get out of the ingredients. Here's an example of four different ingredients. They are all co-products from the corn industry, and we have corn gluten meal, corn germ meal, DDGS, and hominy feed. And listed here are concentrations of crude protein in the blue bars, acid hydrolyzed ether extract or fat in the red bars, NDF, which is the fiber in the orange bars, and starch in the green bars. And we will see that corn gluten meal is a high protein ingredient containing more than 60% crude protein. There's, however, very little fat in corn gluten meal. There's a little bit less than 30% fiber, so it's a medium high fiber concentration, and there's a low concentration of starch in this ingredient. Corn germ meal contains much less protein, contains very little fat, but contains almost 50%. NDF, which means the fiber concentration in this ingredient is very high. Starch is relatively low as well. DDGS has a medium concentration of protein, a relatively high concentration of fat of about 10%, and a medium concentration of NDF or fiber also at about 32%. Starch is relatively low in DDGS. However, when we look at hominy feed, we have low concentration of protein, low concentration of fat, low concentration of fiber, and high concentration of starch. So we can see from this that although all four ingredients here are co-products from the corn industry, they are very different in terms of their nutritional concentrations. And therefore, it is important to analyze the ingredients to correctly characterize and estimate the nutritional value of these ingredients. Here's another example of feed ingredient evaluation. We have sunflower seeds and sunflower meal. And sunflower seeds in the blue bar contains 54% crude fat or ether extract, whereas sunflower meal contains only 1.6%. And this is no surprise because sunflower meal is simply the meal that is left over from sunflower seeds that have been defatted. So it's produced by taking the fat out of these sunflower seeds. However, things are not always as we expect them to be. And we have listed here on the left the concentrations of nutrients in sunflower seeds, 54.5% acid hydrolyzed ether extract or fat, as we saw before, 22.1% crude protein, lysine is 0.2%. 79%, NDF is 8.1%, and moisture is 10%. If we take these values and we have measured 1.6% fat in the sunflower meal, then we should be able to calculate how much crude protein, how much lysine, how much NDF, and how much moisture is left in the sunflower meal because the sunflower meal is simply the defatted sunflower seeds. And if we do this calculation, we'll see that we expect sunflower meal to contain 47.1% crude protein, 1.67% lysine, 
17.3% NDF and 10% moisture. However, we recently conducted experiments with sunflower meal and we got sunflower meal and sunflower seeds delivered to the University of Illinois. And we can see the product we got delivered is listed here on the right. And the acid hydrolyzed ether extract was 1.6% as we had expected. However, crude protein and lysine was only 29.4 and 1.01% respectively, and not 47.1 and 1.67% as we had expected by calculating simply from the sunflower seeds. So the delivered sunflower meal were different from what we expected. And the reason we had this relatively low concentration of crude protein and lysine in the delivered sunflower meal was that the NDF was much greater than we had expected. You can see here we had expected NDF concentration to be 17.3%. However, when we analyzed the sunflower meal, we had 39.3%. So we conclude from this that it is important to analyze ingredients to know exactly what we have in there, and sometimes things are not exactly what we expect. Here's another example of why things need to be analyzed. And I said before, we need to analyze for amino acids, not only crude protein, to evaluate the crude protein portion of the feed ingredient. We have here three feed ingredients, soybean meal, corn gluten meal, and DDDS. The crude protein concentration in these three ingredients are 47.5% in soybean meal, 62.9% in corn gluten meal, and 27.5% in DDDS. Lysine and tryptophan in soybean meal are 3.02 and 0.65% respectively. However, corn gluten meal, which contained more crude protein than soybean meal, contains much less lysine, only 1.18% versus 3.02% in soybean meal, and also much less tryptophan, 0.44% versus 0.65%. So we can see here that although the crude protein concentration in corn gluten meal is greater than in soybean meal, the concentration of amino acids is actually much lower. And the same is true for DDDS. We have a lower crude protein concentration in DDDS compared with soybean meal, but also a much lower concentration of both lysine and tryptophan. And to try to evaluate different feed ingredients, we can actually calculate each amino acid as a percentage of the total crude protein concentration in that ingredient. If we do that, we will get an understanding of the quality of the protein that we have in the ingredient. And we can see here for soybean meal, lysine is 6.35% of the total crude protein, whereas in corn gluten meal, it's only 1.88%, and in DDGS, it's 2.84%. So much lower concentration of lysine as a percentage of crude protein in corn gluten meal and DDDS compared with soybean meal. And we can see the exact same thing is true for tryptophan. We have a greater concentration of tryptophan as percentage of crude protein in soybean meal compared with corn gluten meal and DDDS. So the bottom line here is that it's not enough to only analyze for crude protein when we evaluate feed ingredients. We need to analyze for amino acids. And if we want to estimate the quality of the protein in our feed ingredients, then it is a good idea to express the amino acids as a percentage of crude protein in the ingredient and compare ingredients that way. That will give us an estimate of the protein quality in the ingredients. Another thing that may happen in feed ingredients is that if they are heated or dried, they could be damaged and that will result in particular in problems for lysine and lysine digestibility. And this is something that happens if sugars and proteins are heated together. And we get something that's called a Maillard reaction. And during this Maillard reaction, lysine will go through a series of chemical reactions and eventually give rise to products we call amadori products and melanoidins. Melanoidins are cyclic compounds that are completely indigestible and gives no protein value to the animal. So the more lysine that have been turned into melanoidins, 
less is the concentration of lysine in that ingredient. Amadori compounds, however, will to some degree reduce the lysine concentration, but may also reduce lysine digestibility. So it follows from this that if we have heat damaged feed ingredients, we have a lower digestibility of lysine and a lower concentration of lysine in this ingredient. And this is because we have part of the lysine that have been made unreactive or undigestible because of the heat damage. We call that unreactive lysine, whereas part of the lysine is still reactive because it was not heat damaged. And here's an example of soybean meal that was heat treated. You can see on the left we have a controlled soybean meal. We did not heat treat that. The second sample of soybean meal had been autoclaved for 15 minutes at 125 degrees Celsius. The third sample had been autoclaved for 30 minutes at 125 degrees Celsius. And the fourth sample was oven dried for 30 minutes at 125 degrees Celsius as well. And you can clearly tell here that the color of the two autoclaved samples changed as we autoclaved them, whereas the oven dried soybean meal did not change in color. And this is illustrated also in the numbers that are shown here for the L star value, which gives an indication of the lightness of the product. And as you would expect, the more we heat these samples, the lower is the L star value for the products going down from 76.7 to 61.7 and 52.5 for the soybean meal that was autoclaved for 30 minutes at 125 degrees Celsius. However, the oven dried soybean meal did not change in L star value, and that indicates that this sample was not heat damaged. When we look at A star, which is a measure of the redness of the colors, we can see the A star went up from 3.4 to 10.0 and 12.5% in the two autoclave samples as they got heat damaged, whereas the oven dried sample did not change in A star value. So again, we clearly see here that two of the samples that were autoclaved, they changed in color as they were heat damaged. We fed all four of these soybean meals to growing pigs, and we determined the digestibility of amino acids in these samples. And this shows the effect of autoclaving time on the apparent ileal digestibility and the standardized ileal digestibility of lysine. And we can clearly see here that when we autoclaved the samples for 15 minutes or for 30 minutes, we reduced both the apparent ileal digestibility and the standardized ileal digestibility of lysine. And the standardized ileal digestibility went down from 93% to 84.2%. We take a look at the concentration of lysine and crude protein in these four samples of soybean meal. We'll see that the concentration of crude protein did not change as we heat treated these soybean meals. So crude protein stays constant. However, the concentration of lysine was reduced from 3.05 to 2.83 and 2.69% as we autoclaved the samples. Whereas the oven dried soybean meal had the same concentration of lysine as a control sample, indicating that the oven dried sample was not heat damaged. And we saw before that as we autoclaved the soybean meal samples, we reduced the digestibility of lysine in these samples. And now we see here that we also reduce the total concentration of lysine in the sample. And that fits with our hypothesis that heat treatment and heat damage will reduce the digestibility of lysine and the total concentration of lysine at the same time. We can get an estimate of this heat damage by calculating the lysine to crude protein ratio and express lysine as a percentage of crude protein. And we can see here that in the controlled soybean meal, the lysine to crude protein ratio is 6.29%, whereas in the two autoclaved samples, it's only 5.75 and 5.57%. So this shows also that the two autoclaved samples were heat damaged because the lysine to crude protein ratio goes down. In contrast, the oven dried sample had a lysine to crude protein ratio that was not different from the control. So what this indicates is that 
if we analyze our feed ingredients for both crude protein and lysine, then we can calculate the lysine to crude protein ratio. And if we know what that ratio is for the undamaged or the control ingredient, we know what it should be. Then we can look at each delivered ingredient and determine if that ingredient was heat damaged. The control or the undamaged ingredient will have a different lysine to crude protein ratio for each ingredient. So that is something that's unique for each ingredient. But once we have established that, we can actually look at each delivered ingredient and determine what the degree of heat damage in this ingredient is. So again, calculating lysine to crude protein ratio helps us estimate the quality of the protein in the ingredients. So this concludes the first part of our presentation on methodologies to evaluate feed ingredients. And the second part will be available shortly. And in the second part, we will discuss what happens to the nutrients that are present in the feed ingredients after the pig has ingested the feed. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if you are interested in more information, please visit our website at nutrition.ansi.illinois.edu. Thank you very much.